This episode is brought to you by the Boneyard Huskies Club. The Boneyard Huskies Club empowers athletes while providing UConn fans with access to exclusive community, utility, and rewards. The Boneyard Huskies Club is excited to announce the next collection of student athlete collectibles, which grant club membership privileges, will feature UConn men's basketball players, and will drop on January 16th, 2023. For more information, go to BoneyardHuskiesClub.com. That's Huskies with a YZ at the end. BoneyardHuskiesClub.com. Okay, one of my favorite Big East matchups of the year is uh, going to play Marquette. It, a couple of years ago was the start of the big Yukon Hot Sauce Challenge and the big comeback over Marquette. So we'll see what's in store this time when they head over to uh, to Marquette. So join me, Andre Greska of Paint Touches. He's been on us on with us the past couple of years. Always love having him on. So welcome back to the podcast. Thanks. I love being on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So all in all, things have been pretty good so far for Marquette this year. I'm curious, and and I love asking this when people come on the podcast, take me through the expectations you had for this Marquette team heading into the season, and how do you feel like they've lived up to those expectations at this point? Uh, So really, from a fan standpoint, um, probably we were thinking middle tier, so not not anywhere to the top, probably not second tier, but but, but lower second, upper third. So between like fifth, sixth, seventh was probably where um, an average fan, I'd say average w- would expect it to go. Um, but I thought I was on the pessimistic side because I thought they would be closer to seven than to five within that range. Um, There's just too much loss. I wrote a huge um, column before the year started on just exactly what the pessimistic scenario would be. And the fact is there wasn't going to be any score. Justin Lewis, you know, he did a little bit of everything, just took all over the team uh, during conference play last year. He uh, entered the draft and he's with the Bulls now um, injured, but he's gone. Daryl Morsell, yeah. he's a, he was a great kind of when the things were going bad, he, he could hit a, a bucket by himself. He could take it to the hole, he could get to the line. He's gone. Um, Kirk West, the big guy in the middle, um, obviously he didn't create a ton for himself, but he could finish and block. I, I think he had like six blocks a couple, couple games in the Big East. So, so you lost a ton of very kind of um, – Commod- uh, commodities you knew exactly what you were going to get yeah um but I, I was very um bullish on on the growth and that was that's a big thing with shaka he's he's big on relationships victory and growth in his first press conference he that's this is where his three pillars he said we're going to build the relationships uh, we're going to get victory through growth so he, they really didn't bring anyone to this to the team even though they lost a, a good chunk um zach reitzel he was a transfer from naia school new um loyola new orleans but he's been injured most of the year he's out um so they, they've literally got like 25 minutes for the whole season from him so it's been all of last year's pieces and then to see that what i thought was going to be an elite defense kind of scrape of the seat of your pants offense is like the complete yeah. opposite it's just it's mind-blowing and it's been such a wonderful t- team to watch because mm-hmm. um shaka brings it up basically every single game there's not a lot of players you would take first so like there were i think there was on twitter this morning there's a big east draft who would you take oh yeah um, exactly. yeah and i think big east bar room and you don't you can't quibble with what they're saying because the individual talent on other teams is is greater like you would definitely pick some of these players first but when they play together um it's just how those pieces fit yeah Yeah. exactly the 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 sum is greater than the parts and that was the big thing with wojo um so i remember my first time i went on with you um i think it was 2020 and i and i i remember because i clipped this this guy i'm like i'm never right and this was the only thing i've ever gotten around in my life i was like (laughs) yeah you don't know what you're gonna get we could be up by 10 at halftime and lose by 10 and like sure enough, we were up that's at ten and a half time and lost by like twelve. So that that's the kind of thing that has changed. That the individual pieces don't stand out on their own. Like there's no one you're super scared of. Like yeah, Oso's good inside. You can pass. Cola could drop fifteen dimes on Georgetown. Um, Jones, Cam Jones can hit from just about anywhere. Omex can take yeah. it to the rim. But none of those players are you're gonna like have nightmares over and be like, how are we gonna guard this guy? It's really a collective unit, and so. I think they've exceeded my expectations by a lot. I thought best case scenario would probably be a bubbleish team this year with mm-hmm. most likely being um, NIT or kind of just scraping in right now, depends on who you look at, but for T rank, the average seed is about a six in. So we're, we're talking about close, getting closer to protected territory than, yeah. than to the bubble. So um, again, 
everyone in, at Marquette's going to have a little different. There's people that have been very bullish. Some of the people that I talk to a lot, um, crack sidewalks in particular, they've been on the train like, hey, this is this is a top tier team. Um, there's the pieces are there. It's just about growth. So uh, for me personally, I'm I'm extremely surprised. Super gratifying to see kind of the the evolution of this team. Yeah, I, I think heading into this season, I thought Marquette would probably be one of those like mid to lower tier teams, maybe like looking at like six or so in the Big yeah. East. And, and then I saw that game against Baylor and it like opened my eyes. I'm like, like <laughs> may, maybe there is something cooking here. Like, you know, yeah. you know what Shaka could do. Maybe there is a way that this team can maybe be a little bit ahead of schedule. Is that the game that it hit you that like maybe we've got a little bit more than we thought here? didn't because that was a game that was like a dream game you know when you're falling asleep and you're thinking about the next day you're like yeah you know everything's gonna go right and they're gonna have every shot and that first half in particular was like you couldn't have scripted it any better if you if you scripted it people wouldn't believe you it's like one of those friday night lights endings or whatever um so i i was super happy but that was more like a once in a decade kind of experience like everything went right um kind of and it won't happen again, but hey, this team has has another level. Um, I think they jumped into the top 20 of T-Ranks offense at that point. So that's when I was like, this, this is weird. Like, I know yeah. right now there's not a lot of data in here. We don't know if, how much we can trust it. Um, but really, and it's weird because they're not good. But no, when they visited Notre Dame, that was the game that for me sealed it. Because it really showed that they could pretty much go anywhere in yeah. and, take it on the road it's not just a home environment and and really like just kick butt and that was not a, a team i expected to ever kick butt um and obviously notre dame it has been terrible this year so it, yeah. it doesn't turn out to be that big of an accomplishment but i think for me i i started buying in a little bit more after notre dame than after baylor because baylor was just kind of once in a lifetime awesome experience yeah. notre dame was repeatable and um now we've seen it a few times yeah so so take us through the marquette roster a little bit for maybe yeah. the fans who haven't necessarily seen a ton of marquette and i want you to start with a guy i put out there i, I tweeted out there the other day in tyler Colek. i think he's yeah. my favorite Big East player outside you know if you, i had to say anyone outside of UConn, like if i yep. could put one guy on my team i'd want him uh start with him and then walk us yeah. through the roster so i was talking to the georgetown people um uh, via, via email and they asked me to describe his game i'm like you know that one guy at the, the ymca at the rec <laughs> he's got knee braces on can't jump over a piece of paper not fast really can't shoot either but he runs every single game like everything rotates <laughs> around him he is the sun and that that's tyler so he's not a great shooter he's shooting better this year but nothing gangbusters yeah he really can't finish at the rim i think he's our lowest uh percentage two point within like the restricted area um but he could just get everything moving so what he does is he constantly probes constantly uses the pick and roll to find that opening um and he's a wizard with the ball like one-handed off the left foot off the right foot two-handed skip passes bounce passes pretty much any kind you want so he has a really good rapport particularly with Oso Agadaro the big guy so they run a mm-hmm. ton of ball screens and if you slip for a second like that's a dunk right there the, the pick and roll is money um, and what's happening now is obviously people are staying home a little bit more so if there's a lane he's he's been scoring at a better rate so I think he finished the year last year at like 94 per, rating on Ken Palm he's at about 119 this year so he's taking a huge step up at least taking what the defense gives him yeah but yeah like you said he's so much fun to watch so even if you're not a Marquette fan like he's always doing something like what is he doing like that Exactly. Yeah, I'm like, how, how did he do that? Or, you know, yeah, and, and he'll, he'll make a turnover once in a while because he's trying some of this stuff that like shouldn't be tried on an actual basketball court, he, but that's what makes him so much. So he had 15 assists against Georgetown and he came out with four minutes to go. He only played 26 yeah. minutes. So, I mean, 15 yeah. assists in 26. You know, Georgetown, you kind of got to cut in half, but eight assists yeah. in, yeah. in 26 <laughs> minutes, you, you, you can't beat that. Um, so no. that's, that's the like the, what Chaka says, he he makes everything go. Like yep. that is the engine of the offense. But there's some really good pieces. So Cam Jones, he was also on the team last year. Well, they all were, but um, he's taken a huge step up in terms of his scoring responsibility. And the thing you'll notice about him is he's only 6'4", not a great athlete. He's, he's got range. Um, so he's definitely a shooter. And he's mm-hmm. but what he's able to do is 
Um, this year, he's been able to take it to the hole instead of just kind of stick on the perimeter. Okay. Um, I noted at the beginning of the year, he was the first Big East player since at least 2008 to not take one free throw wow. for a full conference <laughs> season that's last crazy. year. That's so crazy. It, it's nuts. It was it was unbelievable. Um, so that's a, good, that's a good fun fact. That's going to yeah. come up during like a Marquette broadcast in like they, five they, years. Well, they, yeah. I constantly bring it up like last year versus this year to see that growth. Um, obviously, he's a, he plays more minutes now, but what he's doing is he has this tremendous kind of at the rim game again a kind of old man weird english off the glass kind of funky but he's one of the best um undersized scorers at the rim i think he was the best i haven't checked in a couple weeks but under six six he was shooting 73 percent at the rim or something like that so what you'll see is he's he's very good um at kind of creating his own shot which is not a, a thing that this team doesn't have a lot of so that's why he gets a lot of possessions you have omax uh olivier maxens prosper he's six eight um, he's technically the heaviest guy on the team. Uh, he will lead the the press, so he'll actually be the the, the head of the press. They're not a real full court press, more of a token kind of zone um, mm-hmm. to slow out, down the defense. But on offense, what he's been doing tremendously this year is getting to the foul line. So what he does, uh, particularly against Baylor, it's when he had a real breakout game, and then against St. John's um, last week, early, earlier this week, whenever, um, really kind of t- taking over when there's not someone that can stop him. So he gets off the dribble, a lot of back cuts. Um, shooting is, is touch or go, um, but really getting to the rim is, is his specialty. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, Godaro, his range is about four feet, but he is also a wizard with the ball. So w- what ends up happening a lot is he plays like a secondary point guard. Not as in bringing the ball up, but when the pick and roll kind of stalls out, what they'll do a lot of times is they'll throw it into him on the on the elbow. So that mm-hmm. draws out the, the big and the that leaves the back, the baseline open for cuts. So there's a lot of back cuts that you'll see um, from him throw, throwing the dimes as, as they're cutting. And then you got Stevie Mitchell, who up until like two weeks ago, you probably would have said he's a defensive kind of guy. He's does all the little things. Great to have glue glue guy, but not really someone you're worried about. But he's, he's taking a step forward with his offense, too. He's starting to hit the three ball. He's he's open in the corner all the time because I've just described like six yeah. players that can, can move around and do stuff. Um, so he... <laughs> he's the one that's usually gets free um, more often than not. So his, his shooting really d- it depends on how many t- times he takes it, but he's there every game. So that, yeah. that's kind of the, the starting five. And I bring those up because per hoop Explorer, which is a great site, uh, a free site that um, kind of compares a lot of the, um, all, all the teams that put against plus minus stats and, and adjust for, for the competition. Uh, there's no better starting five. There's no better five man lineup in the country than Marquette's um, wow. playing at least 100 possessions. That, that, that's how good that five has been. So you mentioned how good that five is. And I, I'm curious, because one, one thing you kind of shown some success at is exploiting some of these teams that don't necessarily have a ton of depth yes. in, in running, you know, that starting five kind of into the ground. And then the next thing you know, they go on a 15 to two run. And yes. it's like, how did this game get away from them? Does Marquette have depth to back up these guys? Or is this a game where, you know, UConn might be able to put some pressure yeah. on these guys? Not at that level. So that this is the thing that happened with Purdue. You'll have David Joplin. He'll be the first guy off the bench. Um, he's not a great defender, but he, he, I think he leads the conference in usage rate. So he comes in, he's shooting and he's shooting a lot, whether he misses or, or not. Um, you'll have Chase Ross. He's a freshman. Um, you'll remember that name because he's, he's kind of a bit piece at this time, a role player, but he's got that look in him that you're really like, Oh yeah. They, they told us about him in about two or three years. I'm going to, cl- I'm going to clip, the, gonna clip yeah, that one. Yeah. Which- and then Sean Jones, he's about five, eight, if you're being generous, uh, quick <laughs> as a lightning, but he hasn't played a ton in road games. Okay. Uh, very, very much in the freshman mold of kind of the stage would be too big for him. So yes. Um, once the five kind of gets rotated out, the potency is not there in terms of depth. So they, they use a lot of players. I think there's eight or nine that get at least 10 minutes um, with Ben Gold kind of being the backup for Oso Godaro, even though he's not really a five and doesn't play the five. Um, but what ends up happening is that you, they have to rely on the starters a bit more against these some of these uh, better teams and yeah. obviously you can being one of them. So what ends up happening is they run out of gas. So you, you noticed against Providence, they were up by nine with like eight minutes to go. And the, the offense kind of ran dry against Purdue. They were up by 10 and the, the offense kind of ran dry. So what you see is um, as the minute load kind of increases because the quality of competition yeah. increases, there's not that kind of second level late. Usually again, um, that's what we've seen so far. So that is definitely a concern. 
And uh, when you're bringing probably the best big in the country off the bench is <laughs> that's that's the biggest nightmare inducing fuel for, for any Marquette fans. <laughs> so talking about some of these matchups that you might see, um, do you see anything from the Marquette side of like a matchup that I don't want to say you're salivating at, but you think like here's a way that Marquette can exploit UConn and then maybe vice versa. Do you see a way that UConn might be able to exploit some of Marquette's weaknesses? Well, we'll start with UConn because that's easy. You're probably, if you're a betting type and if you're, your preferred book does some of these fancy bets, I would like whatever the offensive rebounding number is, you could just cash that in because it's going to be double that. <laughs> so if it's like Sunilgo, six offensive rebounds, yeah, you, I'd, I'd go in easy. And this team has been very, very poor against the elite rebounding team. So three of their four losses have come against Purdue, which is like number one or two in the country in offensive rebounding, Mississippi State, which is number seven in the country in offensive rebounding, Uh, Providence, which is 17 in offensive rebounding. So I think that's the area where... And not, not, yeah, not not to interrupt you there, but mm-hmm. UConn just got out rebounded by like 15 by Creighton, and I have a feeling all they're doing the next right, are yeah, rebounding drills. So if yeah, Hurley's going to be like, team, you see that? Yeah. You let him get that board off. Yeah, so, yeah, so I actually watched the end of that, and there was a, like a position where there was like three straight offensive yeah. rebounds that kind of like right at the end it. that kind of closed well, it. Do you yeah. remember last year against um against Marquette? There was that yeah. one possession that was like two minutes straight, and then I think it was who was it? Um, I'm not sure. Someone just hit the dagger. But um, that that's the kind of stuff that's been a killer against Wisconsin. There was a minute and a half possession because they got three rebounds uh, and some of these extended possessions where it just kills your legs defensively. Yeah, um, that that's going to happen. It's just a matter of limiting how many times. So that's that's the biggest difference. And um, I was looking the first thing I look at for Marquette is can this team defend the pick and roll because Mark has pick and roll is so lethal. If you're not in the top like 50 percent, like I'm going to take it to the bank. That's going to be the over yeah. and, on the and that. Marquette's offense is going to do fairly well. Uh, UConn's defense uh, for against the pick and roll and passing is in the upper 80th percentile. So that's not an easy kind of, well, yeah. there might be an opportunity there. Uh, so when, when looking at the matchups, it, it, it's like my nightmare. There's nothing in there um, that would tell me that Marquette might have an easy time or might exploit or try to go against because even Kolek, like I'm not, I'm not even sure who's going to guard him because I could see Jackson kind of taking him for a bit, and kind of just swallowing him whole at the perimeter. And if if you kind of contain that, then you're kind of having to create with yeah. either Cam or, or Omax, and that's that's not necessarily the best offense Marquette has. So um, I don't know if the pressure will be as ramped up, but I still think their best bet is to kind of turn um, UConn over as much as possible because for as well as you kind of has protected the ball. I still think the point guard position is the one area where yeah. there is, there's a little bit of potential for Marquette to kind of exploit. No, I think that's interesting. And I think you kind of segued in nicely to a question I had. And, and I love trying to figure out who Andre Jackson is going to be on in yeah. these games. Um, Cause it's always just such an interesting matchup just to watch him defensively and what he could do against these guys. Do, do you think it's Colick or if it's not him, who else could you see him on as kind of like the, the main focal point there? I could see him on cam, kind of, but the thing is, he likes to rove around, like watching. He doesn't just guard one guy; he's guarding yeah. like three guys at once, and that's the problem. If you if you put him on someone like Cam, is Cam can burn you yeah. off, off the shot if he's helping, if he's if he's doubling the post, whatever. So I do think we're going to see a decent bit against Kolek. Uh, obviously, with the caveat that there's going to be a ton of pick and roll and. Um, I don't know how Hurley's going to play it. Uh, I know for some of the times that I've seen it, they've, they've kind of not switched. So they've trying to gone and gone yeah. over or gone onto the screen. So I, I believe that, that he gets a, a pretty big dose of cola because that that's really the key right there. If you can kind of stop the ball from moving around, um, you, you can, you can kind of create some of these mismatches, uh, but the, at the other hand, Omax against some of the bigger teams. So he scored again in the twenties against Baylor. Um, that's the big difference. He kind of quiets against some of the elite competition where he doesn't have a huge size advantage. Yeah. Um, I don't know who's going to be on him. I'm, I was kind of going through the roster. So if it's not Jackson on him, um, then he might have an opportunity to kind of, get downhill um so we'll see how that that kind of plays out so Nogo had you know a couple you know subpar outings by his standards before he kind of exploded against Creighton how do you see him handling you know going up against the you know the bigs that you guys have so Marquette is not great defending post-ups and I, th- I was looking that you kind of in the top 10 percent in post-up uh offensive offensive efficiency 
So he's going to have a field day, um, both kind of posting up and working the boards. Cause I think that's where the, a lot of the points are, are there to be had. Marquette switches a lot defensively, gets lost a lot in terms of Kolek might be guarding Sonogo, yeah. uh, trying to, trying to rebound. Um, so I think what's going to happen is the way they played Edie, uh, cause I had the same kind of fear going yeah. in and they actually played him really well. They threw a soft double before he had the ball. So th- th- that was crazy i, I ha- really haven't seen it since uh but I'm, I'm guessing we'll see something like that where whoever was in the the corner opposite the ball um r- kind of like cheated over and then left that guy a little bit so as soon as Edie had the ball there was two on him it wasn't like yeah he, he he was dribbling or kind of backing in and then the double came it was it was instant um because the he was already helping over whoever that was, whether it was Cam or Stevie. So I think we'll see a lot of doubling the post and really kind of forcing the perimeter of players to beat them. So um, watching some of the game against Providence, I like, I, I think that was some of Providence's game plan too, is like yeah. make Andre beat you with the shot. Like if he beats you, you tip your hat and, and that's, that's the game, but you can't have, um, you can't have Sonogo eaten inside. You can't have, uh, and you can't leave, um, what's, what's his name? Um, Hawkins yeah. anywhere. Cause you, if, if you sneeze, he's, he's going to hit that three. <laughs> um, so the, the thing is, where's is the double coming from and how is the rotation once he passes out? Cause Sonogo's a pretty good passer from the post, even if, if he's not always looking to pass. Um, so I think that's, that's an opportunity for him because if he wants, if he wants to, to, had those assist numbers it'll be there for him all right i i think it's gonna be an interesting game i mean these ones always set up to be fun so we'll we'll, we'll see what happens here but I'll, I'll get you out with this one if you had to uh make a bit of a prediction heading into this one how are you feeling you know i'll go home on this one i say marquette only loses by eight all okay. right i'm oh, gonna okay. i'm gonna yeah uh, I, like i said any other team in the country um marquette's playing very well i'm very confident in, in kind of what their abilities is the, the matchup is does not bode well I and like, i i don't think i don't think it happens tonight or wednesday night yeah i feel like everyone come conference play has that one team that they just like dread matching up yes. with that they just feel like they just can't exploit them or it's, they're just like one step ahead of them that just yeah. makes it really tough so maybe this is the one for hey, you guys, i so. mean i've been wrong plenty so that may this be another one for me <laughs> yeah well, well when, when they uh when uconn wins by eight i'll clip this again for you so you have uh be two for two on the sounds uh, good predictions there. <laughs> but andre really appreciate the time um i hope everyone checks out pain touches be sure to give them a follow uh not only just all marquette marquette things but you, you go into all things biggies so really yeah. great resource come this time of year is uh is it really starts to get exciting So, uh, Andre, thanks so much for coming on. No, thanks for having me.